First case, it's United States of America versus Mark Unrein. And I see Mr. Burns is ready to go. Ms. Sider is here for the government. You may proceed, Mr. Burns. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. I'm Thomas Burns, and I represent Mr. Unrein. The District Court committed two errors when it precluded Mr. Unrein's entrapment defense. First, it committed harmful legal error when it denied the entrapment instruction. And second, it committed structural error when it prevented Mr. Unrein from presenting an entrapment story to the jury. Aren't there two elements of uh, entrapment, lack of predisposition and inducement? Correct. Aren't there some recordings that were admitted into evidence where he indicated that he'd had um, sex with a with an under, underage minor before? Uh, there, there is, but there isn't context necessarily to that particular admission. He doesn't say if he did that when he was an adult or if he was, you know, 16 years old or 14 years old. Um, and we also. He, don't know admitted, how a jury would have resolved that particular question because the jury never really got to consider the predisposition part of the entrapment defense because it never considered entrapment. Um, the, the only thing that was before the district court was the legal ruling on inducement, and that doesn't have to do with a defendant's predisposition. It just has to do with uh, the conduct that the, the government engaged in. Well, as far as lack of predisposition goes... If he was an adult and he had a relation with an underage minor before, that would be the end of the matter, right? I mean, that would establish, I mean, he would be unable to establish lack of predisposition. It, it, it would be beyond my abilities as a lawyer to, right. uh, and as to far as, argue that. As far as inducement is concerned, um, didn't the agent give him, a couple, give him a couple of opportunities to back out? That's correct. Uh, the agent did do that. Um, but there isn't a case in this circuit that says the fact that you've given uh, somebody an option, uh, opportunity to back out in and of itself means that you haven't established inducement. It's important to, to realize that or to recognize that inducement is simply a burden of production on the defendant. It's not really a burden of persuasion. And the question that's before the district court is, based on this record, could a jury have reasonable doubt about entrapment. Um, and our position is that the district court made an error of law that you get to review de novo uh, because it, it didn't realize that this evidence was sufficient to get to a jury. Now, uh, in terms of convincing a jury about that, that you know, that's sort of anybody's guess because we don't know what, what he, it wasn't presented to the jury. He still argued that to the jury, though, didn't he? I was uh, in trouble. Nibbled on the edges. Uh, the the government points out a couple of things that uh, he said. You know, he was he was salesy. Um, at one point in the four day jury trial, the, the defense counsel used the word entrapment, but that wasn't directed to the agent's conduct in this case. It was it was directed to uh, stings in general and what are, what's the scope of. Con uh, the, the, the limit of conduct that the government can engage in. And he says, well, you don't want to do that because that might be, uh, I, th I think the phrase was sort of like entrapment. Um, but that's not directed to uh, what she was doing with respect to Unrein. He was just talking about a sting in general. I, I, my understanding was that there was absolutely no limit on the evidence you could produce or the arguments you could make to the jury. Am I wrong? It depends on how you interpret the judge's order. Now, when, when the judge granted the government's motion in limine, she didn't enter a written order, but her language is, uh, there's no entrapment here, and you will not be able to have the entrapment defense. That's the court's ruling. Um, and it depends on how you interpret that ruling. My interpretation of that ruling is she's saying, you don't, you don't get to talk about this at all. And I think that's what the defense count... Did, did you ask, uh, uh, did you try to introduce evidence that was uh, uh, rejected, or uh, did you try to make an argument that was uh, held improper? Uh, no. Uh, did, I, did, I did you ask the district court if what she said meant that uh, you were barred from uh, introducing evidence and making argument about your uh, entrapment story? 
Uh, no. Okay, uh, so I, at the very most, uh, you would uh, have an uh, er error that you're talking about that would be subject to plain error. Uh, I disagree with that. Uh, I think that we, we, we created a sufficient record to review the structural error argument uh, by its normal de novo standard. And uh, Why? Here if, you, if you didn't do those things I just asked you about, I did not read your, what the district court said to mean at all that you were limited, and in fact you were not limited. So uh, my view has been uh, uh, that, <laughs> you know, you, you could do whatever you wanted to. I understand your, your point of view. I, I, I disagree with it. Um, I, I think that it was clear from the context of the motions practice and the argument in court before the judge ruled on the motion in limine that that is what she meant. And the, the defense counsel repeatedly said things like, you're tying my hands behind my back, you're, you're, you're giving a pretrial ruling, ruling on entrapment, and now I'm going to be scared to get into that. And the judge then gives a ruling saying, there is no entrapment, and you, you don't get the instruction. And so I think that was the uh, defense counsel's interpretation of the ruling, is, well, now I can't even use the, the word entrapment. And he did that throughout the entire four-day trial, with the one exception when he's talking about gov government conduct in general, not government conduct as it uh, related to um, Mr. Unruh. But, but you talked in your closing argument about uh, the agent uh, talking about the uh, little girl being disappointed if if uh, if you didn't if if the defendant didn't come on and come uh, twice I think she said that and then uh, sounded like she might have been crying you you mentioned all of that right we did uh, and we like I said the, the the defense counsel nibbled around the edges of this but he was he, he understood that he was prevented from talking about entrapment, and that was something that the jury was expecting to hear because during jury selection, one of the jurors said, oh, I, I, you know, I've seen TV. This sounds like entrapment to me. And then the judge says, well, you've raised a legal issue, and I'm going to be dealing with that. So the jury at that point is thinking, oh, well, the judge is going to tell us about entrapment, and then they never get told about entrapment, and the parties never litigate entrapment, and then they go to... Uh, you know, the uh, deliberations, and they're going to have this conversation. It's like, oh, well, I thought when, when, when we did jury selection, I thought this case was about entrapment. And was for, that for whatever reason, it's never been. To serve on the jury? I, I don't remember that. Uh, but I do know that it was, that the question was asked uh, before the Veneery panel, and uh, so the, the entire panel heard the question. Uh, and you know, you, you could draw the inference that they were the whole jury was expecting that. Uh, I, I can look into that and, and give you a, an answer um, later. We'll look into it. Okay. It seems to me that there is overwhelming evidence of predisposition here, uh, and therefore, uh, all of our case law says that uh, uh, the crux, the very focus of entrapment, is predisposition. It seems to me uh, that there simply is no uh, foundation, evidentiary foundation here for an entrapment defense uh, instruction because the evidence of predisposition is overwhelming. It, it could be, but remember we didn't get the instruction and our position is we didn't get to litigate it. So we don't know. I'm, what talking, we I'm talking about the evidentiary foundation which you have to surmount in order to get the instruction. Right. But we don't have to address predisposition in making the sufficiency uh, showing to get the instruction. All, all we need to show is inducement, and then it becomes a jury issue. I, for I'm going to read you what you need to show, and this is under Al Brown case, but it's throughout our case law. An evidentiary, to, 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 to make your evidentiary foundation, you have to show, uh, uh, create a jury issue that, and I'm quoting now, the government's conduct created a substantial risk that the offense would be committed, and listen to this, by a person other than one ready to commit it. It seems clear to me that uh, 
predisposition is bound up in that evidentiary foundation. Again, I understand how you're interpreting that, um, but I think that the two elements how else are can separate. You, how else can you interpret other than one ready to commit it? Because other cases talk about it being inducement only, and then once you establish inducement, it becomes a jury issue on predisposition. I don't know how uh, we could have judges making that factual finding without creating a, a Sixth Amendment problem, because um, that seems to me to be a, a, a factual finding that would have to be determined by the jury. Let, there, me, let me switch a little from, from that and say my understanding is that the element of inducement includes an element of persuasion or coercion of some kind. That's correct. And can you point to anything on these facts, given the fact that he called back again and again and again when she hadn't even returned his calls for a while? Where is the persuasion? Where's the coercion? Well, the, the three things that we would hang our hat on here is she, she offered him friendship, and then she kind of uh, took advantage of his emotions by uh, crying and talking about uh, her daughter's disappointment if he weren't to show up. So those are the things that we would say are the persuasion. Um, and our best case for this, I think, is the United States against Pullman decision from the Ninth Circuit. Now, there are differences between that situation and this situation because that was something that lasted over many weeks, I think months, and this is something that took place over two days. But that's, that's the case that we think is our best one um, to support our, our position. Um, so, you have another issue that you feel is, <laughs> has some merit with the time that you have left? Yeah, the, the other About issue the Craig, that we'd like Craigslist to... Craigslist seems to be... Yeah. The, the, others, the others are sort of, I think... Right, so the, the, those advertisements, uh, we think, created... Uh, the introduction into evidence of those advertisements created an unfair trial. Um, those were advertisements that addressed his relationships with adults, uh, not with, with children. Um, and they were pretty saucy uh, advertisements. They, they, they talked about his sexual proclivities in a number of ways that are quite unusual. Uh, and we rep repeatedly objected to this and said, um, this is going to create an unfair trial. We asked for a mistrial. And uh, we think these pieces of evidence were... Uh, irrelevant and unduly uh, prejudicial. Were those the ads that uh, uh, introduced elements of uh, uh, homosexuality and uh, so forth? Yeah, did, correct. Did, did, did you ask specifically that those be eliminated or redacted? Correct. We asked for everything to be excluded. I'm I didn't ask that. I asked if you, if, if you said... Well, Judge, I see you ruled against me on those, but at least redact anything that has to do with uh, almost his association with homosexuality and transvestites. We we didn't ask for redaction. We we asked for the exclusion of those those. Pieces Did you of ask specifically to exclude only that? Admit everything else. I I, I don't like your ruling on that, but specifically. Uh, exclude those that have that. The, the sequence of events was we objected to everything. The judge splits the baby, and then we still say, Judge, your uh, splitting of the baby is, is inadequate, and we want those things excluded. And if you don't exclude them, we want a mistrial. So I think I, this is a very... So I'm taking your answer to my question to be no. You did not pinpoint specifically uh, the homosexuality and transvestite uh, references? Uh, I th no, I, I think the answer is yes, because we, ex we explained that the reason we want these uh, 21 ads and, and 8 ads out is because of those uh, those specific sexual peccadillos. And, um, and you specifically gonna... said that because of those? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's our position. All uh, right. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Reserve okay. some time for rebuttal, and right. we'll hear from the, the government. Ms. Sider.
May it please the court. <clears throat> Jermaine Sider for the United States. Um, six months of time versus two days wasn't the only difference between this case and Pullman. Do, do you mind answering? Uh, uh, I did not actually look at the record, so I don't know whether he objected specifically to the uh, homosexual uh, references uh, and transvestite references, the ones that might have been more uh, damaging. He did not He did not ask for the specific exclusion of, you mean like a redaction from the ads? No, he did not ask for that. And did he say uh, all of these that you're letting in, Judge, are especially bad because of references to homosexuality and transvestites? That was part of his, his basis was this, these ads were prejudicial because of sexual deviancy. And that was, those were the examples. And he thought homosexuality and transvestites were, were part of this idea that it's what, going to prejudice what, what, the jury. What part of the ones that were admitted, uh, were there just a few that involved this homosexuality and transvestites and so forth? Or... Did it run through the entirety of what uh, was uh, actually admitted? The transvestites, I only saw one ad. And it was, it was I believe the exact language was um, open to dressing feminine sometimes. That was one ad. And then there were a few that were male. There were male seeking male relationships. But these ads, that is, first of all, these ads were... Um, highly probative of his criminal intent. And then when you look at the prejudice, these aren't, these aren't any more prejudicial than the child pornography that he had. I understand that, but what I was trying to aim at is whether he, in effect, uh, made an objection specifically with respect to those uh, and, and, and not with respect to all of the ones that were admitted. He did not. He asked for the exclusion of all... 700 of the ads that he had responded to, and he asked for the exclusion of all 21 ads that he himself had posted. Um, and to what one of you asked if um, one of the judges asked about the juror being stricken, or the juror was stricken, so the juror didn't serve on the panel. Um, so I do want to point to that question. But turning back to... Um, the answer could have influenced the... the, the um people who were ultimately selected to serve on the jury, though, couldn't it? The what? In other words, the jury, um, uh, the member of the veneer was not selected and made reference to entrapment, and so there was an indication that entrapment would be a defense in this case, um, and they were expecting it. Um, that juror's answer could have influenced the others who were selected to serve on the jury, couldn't it? Um, no. For two points. First of all, the, when you look at what the judge said, the judge didn't promise an instruction on entrapment. The juror said, could this be an entrapment? And the, the juror said, could this be an entrapment? And the court said, you've raised a legal issue that the court will be dealing with, but if you serve on this jury, you will be receiving a set of instructions, and you're to follow those instructions whether you believe it or not. And then as to the second point as to whether this would affect the veneer or the other members of the juror, jury, um, I believe there are a few jurors who were on it. He hasn't raised a jury or jury taint issue. That wasn't the issue before this court. And so his, he's raised this point as some kind of, I think, evidence that he was entitled to an entrapment defense. But he didn't satisfy his burden of producing sufficient evidence from which a jury could, could find entrapment. And that's why the court correctly excluded the defense. What was his defense at trial? It's not, you know, it wasn't me on the, on the conversation, on the recorded conversations. What was his defense? His theory of defense at trial, he, has, he had a few, um, but it all went to, I didn't have the intent to entice this child. And he, his theory was, um, I just wanted to go over there to be a father figure. I wanted to go over, and I, he, he did do a little of, I was maybe just interested in April, when the you, adult. When you look at the um, transcript, isn't it evident 
that his defense is I was entrapped. I was entrapped, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The what? I was entrapped, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. That was his entire defense at the trial, wasn't it? He, that, that is essentially what he was arguing, yes. It seems like if that's your defense and the judge refuses to give you an entrapment instruction, my understanding of our case law is it's an extremely low burden of production to produce more than a scintilla of evidence showing government inducement. It's a low burden, isn't it? That's, that's not, but that doesn't say what he had to show. It do, what he had to show was su evidence sufficient from which a reasonable jury could find that the government's conduct created a significant risk that an otherwise innocent person would commit the crime. And that is what, and the evidence didn't show that, and so he was not entitled to a jury instruction. You know, you look at his alleged inducement is the mother saying that my child is so disappointed if you don't come over to have sex with her, which is just another way of saying that this child is super excited for you to come over to have sex with her. That is not something that creates a significant risk or any risk at all that someone who's not willing, already willing to have sex with a child or entice a child would commit child enticement. It's, it's the opposite. It, it would repulse somebody. That is only something you say to motivate someone who's interested in having sex with a child. And so that's why, and, and he, can't point to, he can't point to anything that would show, that would create that significant risk. Um, and are there any other questions on that issue? I have a question on a little different issue. Uh, it, it still has to do with the entrapment uh, defense, but uh, uh, you you cite Sistrunk at page thirteen thirty three and Brown at page six twenty three for the proposition that any inducement to count at all has to be an attempt to manipulate a non criminal motive, mm -hmm. uh, like in one of the cases involving an airline, uh, the. Uh, uh, government agent was uh, saying, "You you got to help this poor fella because the drug lords are about to kill him." You know, correct. Uh, I looked at those pages of those two cases, and I did not see that they supported the position that the manipulation had to re had in order to be counted to deal with a non criminal motive. I, I see the sense of it, but I didn't see any case law to support that. Well, these are different formulations of, these are different ways of saying the kind of conduct that would create a significant risk that an innocent person would commit the crime. And so when you are applying pressure or appealing to or manipulating a non-criminal motive, that is the kind of conduct that would create a significant risk that an innocent person would be, would be committing their, I'm not, we weren't trying to say that that's the only way or that you had to, sh that you have to across the board. There, you have to show it's a manipulation of a non-criminal motive. Um, I, I can see cases where it, you could appeal to someone's criminal motive, but apply a lot of pressure. You know, harass them, and if they say no, and they say, and, and you say, come on, come on, come on. I mean, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, that could, but ultimately, it's the question of taking everything together. Is this something that would create that risk? that it would get someone who's not ready to commit the crime to commit the crime. But, um, and, and, and here we, we don't, when the crime is child enticement, saying that the child's excited to have sex with you is not, not the kind of conduct that would create that risk. If I can turn to something else for now. Um, what's your answer to the defendants pointing out that the prosecutor's closing argument contained some, um, shall we say, maybe remarks that would have been better left out. That were what? Would have been better left out, The some of the things that the prosecutor said in closing. Um, 
we, I mean, these, these comments were not, or our, our position is that these comments were not improper and that they were not prejudicial. Because in particular that you were, you were asking about? Yeah, I'm talking about the, the pictures being disgusting, about mm. scars left on okay. children for the rest of their lives as a result of this kind of conduct, that kind of stuff. Well, the, use, okay, using the word disgusting, that might not, that might, it's not inaccurate. And if anything, it probably benefit, benefits the defendant because this is a shorthand way and less prejudicial way than actually describing what the child pornography depicted. Um, so that's not improper. Um, haunting the closing argument that, oh, is this going to be a really experience, really wonderful experience for a 12 year old, more like Haunter forever? It, Mr. and Ryan's objection was that you needed expert testimony to, to support that argument. And that's just common sense that a child who experiences, a 12 year old girl who experiences sexual abuse is. Going, that's a harmful experience and one that's going to carry with her for a long time. And then the part that he doesn't care about any scars he'll leave on the child, and that goes directly to his theory of defense, which was, I want to be a father figure, a father figure who cares about this child. And that's not what he was doing. I mean, he, he didn't care about the harm that he left on the child. And so these are all just part of, they're relevant to the to, um, they're based on the evidence, and they're, they're, they're not prejudicial to him, and he can't show the harm that these comments would show. What about the uh, question, the concept that I posed to your opponent, that predisposition really is part and parcel of the evidentiary foundation that... Uh, a defendant has to adduce in order to get uh, 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 an instruction. And, and that language is uh, it has to create a substantial risk that the offense would be committed by a person other than one ready to commit it. That other than one ready com to commit it seems clear to me to be predisposition. Uh, what do you think about that concept? And are there cases to support uh, that? I agree that the concept of, yeah, I agree with the concept that predisposition, this is, predisposition is the crux of the entrapment defense. And um, that is wrapped into the definition of inducement because we're asking what someone who's not disposed to do this, how they would respond to the government's conduct. And that is the, that is the standard, and so you you can't separate those two. So I I, I, I looked and I did I, I see lots of cases. I mean, every one of our cases sets this as the standard that defendant has to show this particular evidentiary foundation to get the instruction. Uh, and also, there are many many cases in deciding that issue. Did he give enough? which consider predisposition evidence. But I've never seen a case that says what they're doing, says that they are, in fact, considering predisposition evidence in assessing whether or not the evidentiary foundation to get the entrapment instruction mm -hmm. has been uh, satisfied. Do you know of any? Um, I don't. And I think what you're talking about is all these cases that are pointing out you know, in the last 40 years, since Timberlake, like this court has consistently affirmed the district court's finding that there is insufficient evidence to warrant the entrapment instruction. And those cases are consistently pointing out that the defendant is, has shown no reluctance, has, has, is completely willing and eager to commit this crime. And that is the part that folds into the predisposition that you're talking about, because that is evidence of what an innocent person or, or non, someone who's not predisposed to commit the crime. And so th I think that's where the overlap happens. And I think was what Mr. Um, what counsel has been talking about is the separation of two elements. It goes to um, your evidentiary burden as to each element in order to get the in instruction. But I, I do agree that you can't, 
the concept of predisposition is folded into the inducement definition. Unless the court has any other questions. I see yes. no more questions. Thank you, Ms. Sider. Thank you. And Mr. Burns, you have reserved some time for rebuttal argument. Just want to address a couple of questions that the panel has already asked. Um, uh, Judge Anderson, uh, you were asking about the uh, the objection to the evidentiary rulings. Um, my, I, I suggest you look at uh, Doc 175, pages 10 through 17, and that's where Agent McAteer is testifying, and the exhibit comes in with the, the, the 21 Craigslist posts and the eight additional ones, and that's where counsel says, uh, I object, I move for a mistrial. Now all of Mr. Unrain's sexual proclivities are now supposedly for the jury to judge, even though there's not a single issue in the elements dealing with sexual proclivities except for the interest of a child. <clears throat> he doesn't say uh, uh, homosexuality. Uh, he doesn't say um, you know, some of the specific sexual proclivities, but he just refers to, to them in general. And so that's where we think the uh, objection was sufficient. Um, we've asked about the non-criminal motive. Um, that's uh, Judge Black's opinion in uh, United States against Brown. And uh, there she states the standard. And then she says, as the First Circuit has recently observed, inducement consists of opportunity plus something like excessive pressure or manipulation of a non-criminal motive. Um, one way of reading that is, this is an example. Another way of reading that would be, this is the only way you do it. I think the better way of reading it is like, this is an example of how uh, the defendant can meet his burden under the, um, under the test. Do, do you happen to know what page you're looking at? Uh, it's, it's 624, I think. Okay, yeah, thank you. Of Brown. Um, and it, it cites, oh, wait, I'm looking at the wrong thing, sorry. It's uh, page 623 okay. of Brown, and it's citing United States against Gendron, which is the First Circuit decision. Were you, were you clerking for Judge Black when that opinion was uh, cited? I think I was uh, a junior in high school. All so. right, okay. <laughs> uh, not, not yet. I was thinking about clerking for Judge Black. Um, and then uh, the, the final part is I, I don't think the government, or I guess there's two more points. I don't think the government and I agree on um, how the standard is, is phrased. We, we view it as like it's a burden of production. The evidence is viewed in the light most favorable to us. And the, the government seems to have a view that it's a little bit more difficult than it, it really is. But that's something for you to explore in uh, the opinion that you write. And um, Judge Anderson, you've, you've raised a, a really interesting idea about the predisposition being kind of tucked into the inducement analysis. Uh, like I said, I understand what you're, you're saying. I just I, I don't agree with it. And I can't really. <laughs> explain a, a wonderful answer why that is. I just, I just see it as like it's a burden of production. Once you meet the burden of production, it becomes a jury issue. And I think if it didn't become a jury issue... Even, even if it is a jury issue, and in this particular case, it seems to me the evidence of predisposition is so overwhelming that the jury matter and your right to trial by jury and so forth uh, is beside the point. I understand that too, because that, that would go to, to harmlessness, but our, our response to that would be well, we didn't really get to present our case on predisposition, and so for you to rule on harmlessness as to this would put us in an awkward place where we didn't get to tell our story, and now it's harmless because we were trying to follow what, what the district judge's ruling was. Um, that's, that's our case. Uh, as the other issues, we just rely on the briefs. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Burns, it's not always easy to find a lawyer who's willing to accept a representation in a case like this. So uh, the court thanks you for your service. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.